kind of a, uh, his constant awareness of being on the lookout for birds and kind of his, his desire to, uh, to really understand the natural world to the point that he can make art out of it. Um, he just seems to be in a position where he keeps, either through luck or through his observatory powers, making all kinds of arrests. And, and his problem is, is that he's not very good on human com communications, and so the attention he gets uh, kind of reaches a crescendo of awkwardness. And this is, this is when it kind of peaks right here, just a paragraph. Though he tried to notice as little as possible that could lead to more arrests, paperwork, or acclaim, it was no use. He saw more than ever. He intercepted bugs on Howard Stick, then caught a smuggler on Judson Lake, and yet another in downtown Sumas. And the increased patrols didn't seem to discourage the illegals he kept finding in fields and forests, or sardined into muffler-dragging vans. He apprehended five Filipinos in a Voyager on Froberg Road. Two nights later, he watched a Monte Carlo cruising Markworth Avenue on an obvious decoy run. So he left his rig, jogged up the street, and saw four Cambodians crouched in the ferns, hands over their eyes like kids who didn't understand hide-and-seek yet. The next night he caught four Romanians, then three weeping Mexicans who pleaded with him in Spanish until he would have let them go if he hadn't already radioed them in. They kept coming, as if racing to enter the States before the door slammed shut for good. And nobody resembled the dangerous lying scammers that everyone had warned him about. They were illegal by definition, right? But they didn't look like criminals. Most of them struck Brandon as exotic, even beautiful though they weren't always endearing. Two Iranians lectured him in broken English about the Bill of Rights, followed by an indignant Sri Lankan couple who scolded him for ruining their honeymoon. Brandon stepped into the woods to pee later that night, and nine Venezuelans surrendered. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that, uh, those details actually came out, out of Border Patrol agents' mouths. I mean, because they, they, they told me how, you know, we had no idea there were so many different nationalities that came through Canada to get into the States. And just in that 30-mile stretch, they would get as many as 25 to 30 different nationalities in a month. And, uh, and they, did have, they did have one guy who, uh, who couldn't stop making arrests. And, and, it was, and it was getting to the point where he would fall asleep in his car and he would open up the door to get out and, you know, just get himself awake and people would surrender. <laughs> That's kind of where, where I got some of that. And uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about researching the book was just, uh, was just playing with the whole U.S.-Canadian relations because the more I kind of looked into it and the more I talked to Americans and Canadians, the more I was taken by the notion that, that uh, Canadians seem to perhaps hyperanalyze Americans, or, or there's a lot of, and there's a lot of Canadians that understand U.S. politics far better than most Americans do, <laughs> and, um, and the opposite is just not true. You know, the, the, uh, the uh, Americans, Americans uh, in general tend to forget that Canada exists. Yeah. You know, and there's almost this, this odd neighborly relationship, and, uh, and so I really enjoyed the notion of, you know, when I would go out into the valley out there and I would see Zero Avenue and, and Boundary Road just going right next to each other, and the, the two countries just divided by a ditch, and you got mailboxes right on, right next to the ditch, and and so that's when I started, uh, you know, imagining conversations <laughs> that could go on cross border, and uh, and I, actually I, I found that that was that was good fun, but um in in my work of, of you know going across the border and then winding back and forth, I just did all all kinds of driving and, and taking notes. One of the places I used to come was was White Rock. Because um, it was a nice place to spend the night, and I and I really enjoyed your your uh, downtown strip here, and so um, I think it, is it the iguana is that the bar down there where they have like Frank Sinatra and different uh, the Beatles and so on on the wall, and so I was in there uh, one night having a beer, and I and I wrote this whole scene that I have in the book um, that that basically came out of just wanting to include White Rock. I suddenly decided, well, you know, it's not really in, in the turf of what I'm writing about, but you know, I'm the author, so I'm going to throw a white rock in there. And uh, so I, I wanted to uh, read that scene to you, and then, I'll, uh, and then I'll open it up to questions after that. And if you run out of questions and I need to fill more time, I can fill it. But uh, I just would like to, and I haven't had a chance to read this, this scene uh, anywhere, and so this is kind of fun for me. Um, and, and just to set this up, Brandon has uh, just made an arrest of, of a... a guy who, who, um, who drove across the border uh, over the ditch over there out in the valley, um, drove across the border with a, with a trunk full of explosives, <coughs> and very much like that um, Ahmad Rassam who went across over at uh, Port Angeles uh, coming down through Canada and 
created all that uh, uh, furor. And so what I was doing is just placing somebody like that in the post 9-11 tension and, and having it kind of build everything back up again. And so, um, and he also, there's a, there's a car chase in which uh, um, the guy uh, crashes because Brandon's chasing him in his car and he's in a coma at the time and he's got all these fake IDs that indicate that, you know, perhaps he's Muslim but we don't really know what's going on. Um, and so amid this chaos, um, my, I have my, my two lead Canadian characters here, and that's uh, um, Wayne and Madeleine Rousseau. And Wayne is the, is the retired uh, bombastic University of British Columbia professor who's, who's constantly telling his neighbor on the American side, Brandon's dad, um, about all, you know, how America is screwing up. And, uh, and his daughter is a uh, young aspiring uh, marijuana smuggler. <laughs> and so they're coming here, uh, they're both in White Rock for this evening, even though they live out in the Abbotsford area. And so this is, uh, um, this is that scene here, where the border's kind of in lockdown, and, and this is kind of my, my, my imagined uh, conversation that I overhear here. Listening to the French station, watching herself speed, Madeline drove Zero Avenue, knowing she should have taken the back roads with a hatchback full of pot. She passed hundreds of greenhouses and miles of raspberry fields before cutting through new Pinot Merlot and Chardonnay vineyards. Every third car on the other side of the ditch was a green and white SUV, but the groggy border patrol agents never glanced over. Beyond them, the valley still looked awash, and if she squinted, it turned into a massive bay, the farmhouses and barns, anchored freighters, the vehicles and sheds, leisure boats. She jotted mental notes on the popular foot smuggling routes Toby had marked on her map. He was right. Even with double patrols, it took an idiot to get caught. She wove through queues of exasperated drivers at the Pacific and Peach Ar Peace Arch crossings and rolled west away from the border toward White Rock, where steep, narrow streets turned into toboggan runs in the winter and tall houses jockeyed for people views of the bay. Parking at the marina, she watched a lanky couple necking against a phone booth, cigarettes dangling behind their heads. The northwesterly breeze looked perfect, but she was an hour early and considered rolling a joint to relax before recalling Toby's rules. She marveled uneasily at his growing influence, then strode into the silver twilight and the briny reek of exposed flats. From this angle, the United States looked barely discovered, with only a towering resort hotel and a smattering of light visible on the fringe of a grand forest. White Rock's, White Rock's Bayside Strip of bars, restaurants, ice cream parlors, and boutiques served as BC's Riviera in July and August. In the off-season, it attracted an older set, like the graybeards Madeline found crammed into an alcove in Trudeau's, beneath photos of the Beatles cavorting, Sinatra in a gangster hat, and a shirtless, defiant Jim Morrison. Their conversation was too intense for anyone to notice Wayne's daughter order a margarita, or to hear the board bar bartender tell her the gang of four had expanded to the gang of eight, and that the old boys were drinking twice as much as usual. Madeline couldn't see more than the back of her father's head, but could tell by his honking voice that he was flying on at least three vodka martinis. She eavesdropped on the laments about Vancouver's traffic, the lack of hockey, the idiocy of the premier, and the possibility of the U.S. turning hostile. We could hold them off for, what, ten minutes? Her father's pal, Lenny Reeves, asked. Maybe twenty, Wayne said. The men eyed the darkening bay as if checking for aircraft carriers or marines crashing the beach. What do you think England would do, Lenny asked. We've seen what she'll do, Wayne barked. An enemy of the, of the superpower is an enemy of hers. Ever since WW2, the Brits have mastered the double talk of sucking up while feigning independence. <laughs> yeah, but anybody else want more salsa? R Rocco asked. Yeah, but it's never going to happen, Lenny says. You think their conservatives want to add a 51st state as populous as California and as liberal as Vermont? <laughs> this place used to give us more salsa. As much salsa as we could handle, Rocco said. Who's, who the hell is this bomber anyway, asked an owl-faced man Madeline didn't recognize. I seriously doubt he's a flag-waving Canadian. It's not like we've got lifelong citizens running over the border to blow things up, is it? Well, we're a staging area, as they call it, Lenny said, lunging for the wine. And that's our fault, Wayne said. Can we help it if they piss everybody off so much people start lining up in our yard to throw turds in theirs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of is, Lenny countered. We let anybody in, and by the time their lies are sorted, it's a little late to ask them to get the hell out. They're already here, or down there, he nodded south. Gather the guys in Arab, Rocco said. Thanks, Rocco, that helps a lot. 
Well, they say he's Muslim, right? If he's still in that convenient coma, Wayne pointed out, and if there's a bunch of fake IDs on him, how do we know whether he's a Muslim or a Baptist, a Jew or an atheist? Muslim blood a different shade of red, Rocco? Or is it the beard that gives him away? Does my lousy beard make me a Muslim? Maybe. Personally, Wayne said, I doubt the guy exists. Exists. They invented him? That's right. Why? I think that's obvious. What's obvious? This better blow over by the time that casino opens, Rocco said. That's all I gotta say. Otherwise, truth is, Lenny interrupted, without the U.S. we'd be as irrelevant as seagull shit. <laughs> what are we even talking about here? That's our identity, Lenny said. We are not the U.S. That's who we are. Not this again, Wayne grumbled. Am I wrong? Without them, would we look so rational, polite, and beautiful? The old, the old men stared at one another. Seriously, Lenny continued, his voice rising to the challenge. We are the rebound boyfriend after the hostile divorce. Women love us because we're not the violent, self-absorbed jerks they just dumped. <laughs> Have some more wine, Lenny. Have some more wine. <laughs> Wayne's agitated eyes lifted and traversed the room before settling on the most unexpected of gifts. And in the moment before his daughter felt his glance, he noticed how she slouched over her cocktail like a burdened woman twice her age, straining against some invisible hand. <laughs>